Hello and welcome back to Clinical Cases. Today we're going to be carrying on from last time where we looked at that adenoma carcinoma sequence. We're then going to have a look at some more of the diseases of the GI tract, so things such as gastroesophageal reflux disease, but also things such as stomach cancer and embryological malfunctions such as malrotation and Meckel's diverticulum. So let's begin by having a look at the adenoma carcinoma sequence. So first of all, be aware that an adenocarcinoma is a type of cancerous tumour that can occur in several parts of the body. It's defined as neoplasia of the epithelial tissue that's got glandular origin or glandular characteristics or both of those features. Essentially, the adenoma carcinoma sequence refers to this step-by-step -step pattern of activation of oncogenes or suppression. Um, inactivation of tumor suppressor genes. So normally an oncogene is there and it has the potential to cause cancer. So in tumor cells these are often mutated or expressed at higher levels. On the other hand you've got these tumor suppressor genes such as p53. So when these are inactivated this can cause um, cancer as well. So the biggest link of adenocarcinoma, um, adenoma carcinoma sequence is colorectal cancer, um, which was talked about in the previous video. But here is a little seven-step guide to the tumor development um, and detailing how um, different processes must different processes must occur, such as angiogenesis, so for example the development of the tumor's blood supply, and how it might lead to metastasis. Moving on, we looked at gastroesophageal reflux disease. So, or GORD, and it's a digestive disorder that affects the lower esophageal sphincter mainly, the ring of a muscle between the esophagus and the stomach. And many people, uh, including pregnant women, suffer from heartburn or acid indigestion caused by this gastroesophageal reflux. So it's when the acid that's normally present in the stomach comes back up the esophagus due to that malfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter. And as a result, it can cause the taste of acid in the back of the mouth, it can cause heartburn, but be aware of the difference in the definitions of this between a clinician and a patient. Bad breath, chest pain and vomiting as well. As a result from gastroesophageal reflux, it can lead to esophagitis, so inflammation of the esophagus, esophageal stricture and Barrett's esophagus as well. You can treat this with PPIs such as omeprazole, H2 receptor blockers, lifestyle changes and possibly surgery if it really is so severe. The main method of diagnosis of gastroesophageal reflux is through an OGD uh, and make sure we're not using barium swallow x-ray for the diagnosis. Um, an alternative method to OGD is to use this ambulatory esophageal pH monitoring which is where a probe goes in to the bottom of the esophagus and monitors the pH over a 24 hour period um, and this could be useful if the patient doesn't improve after using PPIs in the first place. So. In terms of pathophysiology, there are three main mechanisms that can cause gastroesophageal reflux. So one that we've already talked about is dysfunctional lower esophageal sphincter, which allows that reflux of large amounts of gastric juice up the esophagus, as shown here. Alternatively, you could have poor esophageal motility, decreasing the clearance of acidic material. Or alternatively, you could have delayed gastric emptying, which can increase the volume and pressure inside the stomach until that valve mechanism is defeated of a lower esophageal sphincter, but ultimately it all does come down to that sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach, and a the malfunction there is what's really leading to the acid reflux back upwards. Zollinger-Ellison syndrome then is a disease in which tumours cause the stomach to produce too much acid, and as a result this then results in peptic ulcers. So one thing to be truly aware of if you want to understand Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is this chain here. So understand that when we take in food, G cells produce gastrin. Gastrin then acts on enterochromaffin like cells to produce histamine, and then histamine acts on parietal cells to release H or acid. So this sequence of events is really important. One other thing to be aware of are D cells, which produce somatostatin, which can block this whole process. But focus on this aspect, the parietal cells producing the acid, and it's this excess acid here which leads to the peptic ulceration, esophagitis, diarrhea, and malabsorption that you may see in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Essentially, one way to detect this would be that a fasting serum gastrin concentration would be elevated. So remember that G cells produce gastrin when we take in food. However, if after fasting your serum gastrin is still elevated, this can be an indication of a gastrinoma, that gastrin-secreting tumour. As a result, it can cause abdo pain and diarrhoea, 
And the diagnosis may also be suspected in patients that have got severe ulceration of the stomach and small intestine and that are failing to respond to treatment for their ulcers. So gastrinomas can occur as a single tumour or they can be multiple small tumours and they occur predominantly throughout the stomach and the small intestine. So this pathophysiology here is a wordy description of this diagram and we can treat these with high dose acid suppression, so PPIs, as we said previously, omeprazole is a good example of that. Or we can do a resection of the gastrinoma, so uh, unless it's already metastasized, of course, and then it may require a different course of treatment. Um, one other thing to be aware of is multiple endocrine neoplasia. So this is a syndrome that um, zollinger ellison syndrome may slot into almost, and it's an autosomally domin dominant um, inherited condition where these patients have tumours in their pituitary and pyrophyroid glands as well as in their small intestine and stomach. Next we look at gastric cancer, which of course is cancer that develops from the lining of the stomach. Um, and the early symptoms may here include heartburn, upper abdo pain, nausea and loss of appetite. However, the later signs may include uh, weight loss, jaundice, vomiting, difficulty swallowing and blood in the stool amongst other symptoms as well. Consequently, it may metastasize to the liver, the lungs, the bones, or the peritoneum. And risk factors for gastric cancer, a common risk factor through many cancers as we've seen is smoking, but also diet and obesity can also contribute. Causes then of gastric cancer, really the two main ones are H. pylori um, and genetics, but Helicobacter pylorus is probably the biggest cause of stomach cancer within the UK. So it can be diagnosed through a biopsy during endoscopy, um, and the problem with stomach cancer is that it's normally diagnosed late because if we can diagnose it early, the surgery is normally curative, um, but because it's poorly responsive to chemotherapy, radiotherapy, diagnosing it late when it's already maybe metastasized, that's the biggest problem. And this leads to this really poor prognosis of a five-year survival rate of 19%. H. pylori then, which is the biggest cause of gastric cancer, is a bacteria that infects the stomach. And it usually happens during childhood and it can live there in the stomach um, unaffecting the individual, causing no symptoms whatsoever. However, if there is a trigger um, which may cause it to become symptomatic, it can cause abdo pain, nausea, loss of appetite, bloating, and that unintentional weight loss we mentioned before. So complications of H. pylori, so ulcers are the main complications, so peptic ulcers, uh, gastritis, so inflammation of the lining of the stomach, but then obviously gastric cancer, as we've just said, is another complication of H. pylori. Uh, in terms of detection, there are several ways of doing this. Uh, most commonly, a uh, good way to do it is the non-invasive 13-carbon urea breath test. Um, so therefore, the bacteria converts the urea into CO2, uh, which is then detected in the exhalation of the patient. So next, we'll have a look at some embryological malformations. So first of all, we have intestinal malrotation. So this is an anomaly of the rotation of amygdala as it returns to the abdominal cavity. So it can also be an absence of rotation, but this is extremely rare, and it's normally a malformation of the rotation, so an incomplete rotation, which leaves the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum on the right-hand side of the abdomen, and the cecum and the colon on the left. Um, have a normal malrotation leads the duodenum to lie super anterior to the superior mesenteric artery and colon, and anterior to the mesentery. So understanding normal embryology here is really, really vital in order to understand what goes wrong in malrotation. Malrotation, however, predisposes to volvulus and hernia. So volvulus is when a loop of intestine twists around itself and the mesentery that supports it. And this results in bowel obstruction, causing abdo pain, bloating and vomiting. Um, and the increased risk of this can be, of course, predisposed by, as we've just said, malrotation, Hirschsprung's disease, abdominal adhesions and an enlarged colon. On the other hand, we've already said that malrotation can predispose to hernias. So an abdominal wall hernia is an opening or area of weakness in the abdominal wall through which the abdominal contents can protrude through. We can treat malrotation and it's normally surgical with the LAD procedure, which is the best currently accepted procedure. Um, and it is able to reduce volvulus as well uh, by dividing the mesenteric band and place the bowel into the appropriate position. So next is another congenital abnormality, and this is Meckel's diverticulum. So this results in a small bulge in the small intestine, which is present at birth, and it's as a result of a vestigial remnant 
or a failure of obliteration of the vitiline duct or the yolk stalk. So it's a rule of twos with Meckel's diverticulum in the respect that you have 2% of the population affected. It's present in the first two years of life. Um, the diverticulum is approximately two feet from the ileocecal valve, and it's approximately two inches in length. Most people with Meckel's diverticulum, however, are asymptomatic, and typically the symptoms develop, if any, before two years of age. Um, if there are symptoms, it will develop with painless rectal bleeding and severe epigastric pain. So again, being aware of that normal embryology here, I'm not going to go through it now, but being aware of that basic normal embryology um, of the mid-gut with the communication with the yolk sac, how that might narrow and how failure to obliterate that can cause it. So awareness of the normal embryology um, allows you to easier understand the um, pathological embryology here. Complications of Meckel's diverticulum include bleeding and intestinal obstruction, as well as diverticulitis and neoplasia. Next, we have some abdominal wall defects that could occur um, congenitally. So first of all, you've got gastroschisis. Um, so this is a birth defect in which the intestines extend outside of the power umbilical abdominal wall. And the rates are higher in those babies that are born to mothers who smoke or drink alcohol during the pregnancy. So what happens versus normal? Well, during week four of the normal development, the lateral body wall folds of the embryo meet at the midline and fuse together to form the anterior body wall. However, in this condition, it fails to do so. And either one or both of those walls um, don't meet properly and they don't fuse as they should. As a result, this incomplete fusion results in a defect that allows the abdominal organs to protrude through the abdominal wall. So this can be seen here as the intestines are outside the abdomen through a hole next to the umbilicus. As a result, you can see this on an antenatal ultrasound um, by free-floating and small fetal abdominal circumference, as well as uh, herniation to the right of the umbilicus. We can treat this with surgery, so returning the exposed intestines within to the abdominal cavity and closing the hole. Um, however, only 10% of single surgeries are successful and 90% have um, affected require another surgery following this. On phalloceles, so I've put these two together because they're really similar conditions, but it's really important to be aware of the subtle differences between the two. So amphalocele is a central birth defect of the abdominal wall beneath the umbilical ring. So and it's not, and it is always covered by a sac, whereas gastrocytes isn't. Um, so the sac that surrounds this omphalocele is made up of amnion, Wharton's jelly and peritoneum. So you can see this surrounded by the sac here. So the intestines, liver and other organs remain outside the abdomen within this sac. Omphalocele can be big or they can be small. And if they're small, it may contain only the intestinal loops. And if they're large, it could contain anything up to the liver, the spleen, the bladder, the testes and the ovary. Risk factors for omphalocele then, these occur more frequently with increased maternal age. And we can do screening uh, via antenatal or sound alike for gastrocytes to see if there's likelihood of this being present at birth. The last thing to talk about in this video are hemorrhoids. And these are vascular structures within the anal canal. And in their normal state, they are just normal cushions that help with stool control. And they only actually become a disease when they're swollen or inflamed. So I'd probably recommend learning the different um, names of these here. So hemorrhoids can be internal or external, which fairly... Um, obviously the internal ones are above this pectinate line um, and then the external ones are below this pectinate line here. So 40% of sufferers display no significant symptoms um, and they can present differently whether they're internal or external. However, most people, if they've got one, they do tend to have the other as well. As a result, the main symptom of hemorrhoids really is bleeding um, and rarely it can cause life-threatening problems um, such as anemia, but this really is rare because it's, it's unlikely that they're going to be bleeding that much. So symptoms of hemorrhoids are usually believed to be as a result of the vascular structures sliding downwards or when the venous pressure is excessively increased. And the internal hemorrhoids are believed to come from that superior hemorrhoidal plexus and the external hemorrhoids are believed to come from the inferior hemorrhoidal plexus. And remember the dentate line or the pectinate line is the division between where those will occur. Um, the causes of hemorrhoids, um, so irregular bowel habits, lack of exercise and nutritional factors and genetics are the main reasons. That's everything for this video. Um, if you do have any feedback, as always, please do let me know. 
uh, and join us next time where we look at more of the GI diseases.